The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by SportsVanarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by SubmissionFC.com. and to the promo code SportsVanarchy10 for 10% off the best Brazilian jiu-jitsu gear. We're also brought to you by the Flex Belt. Summer is approaching fast. You want to strengthen and tone your abs. The Flex Belt, which is FDA cleared, might just be for you. Follow the link in the description below to get your very own. The MMA Discussion Podcast is now available to listen to on iTunes and or the radio podcast app Stitcher, which is available for free on all smartphone devices. If uh, storage is an issue with any of you guys, Stitcher is the best way to go. It's an app. doesn't take any of your data away. It totally works. It's awesome. Get it on your phone. Fight fans, episode 28 of the podcast. Glad to have you on. We're pleased to welcome hot up-and-comer in the UFC's ever-competitive lightweight division. He has a record of 20-4, and four, 18 finishes, two finishes already inside the octagon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Hollywood Casey. How you doing, Johnny? Hey, good, man. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Um, no problem, man. Well, we're glad, we're excited to have you on. First of all, you've had two fights already in the octagon. Um, you're, you're very, you're a very exciting fighter to watch. Um, well, Chris, I know he had a question he wanted to ask you first. I know he was interested. In oh that. yeah, so yeah, just going in, I was looking, doing some research on you to get ready for this. So I saw you wrestled in high school back in Iowa, and um, basically you just jumped straight into MMA once you turned 18. Did you? Just go into MMA with wrestling, or did you have some training in MMA before that? Uh, I, to be honest, I wrestled uh, since I was three years old. And I was uh, through the AAU circuit. It was about you know, two wrestling tournaments that we had you know, since I was a little kid growing up. So um, I wrestled my whole life, and uh, you know, I wasn't that, that smart of a kid. I wasn't too good at academics, but um, I liked to compete. And, and mixed martial arts was just kind of... Um, a natural route, I guess. So yeah, I, I trained probably three months before I had my first amateur fight. I'm just training you know, off. I wouldn't train with any real gyms. It was just a couple guys who uh, who had been fighting around the amateur circuit, um, regional shows, and uh, mm -hmm. ropes, so to say. And uh, then I took my first fight. Was yes. there um like uh did you have a, did you have any amateur fights before you went professional? Yeah, I had two. I actually had two amateur fights before uh, I took my first professional fight. Um, because Iowa wasn't sanctioned, so it was, it was all amateur. Everything was considered amateur fighting. So I had my first amateur fight. I, I was weighing in about 150 pounds, soaking wet. It matched me up with a kid that was like 195, and uh, wow. I, I ended up just yeah, yeah. It was it was uh, that was how they rolled roll back in the day. <laughs> And um, I ended up smashing that guy and knocked him out in my 30 seconds. And uh, then the promoter, uh, a couple months later, asked, asked me to fight again. And the uh, same thing, I ended up smashing that kid really quick. And uh, the promoter was like, hey, man, you know, you're, you're pretty good. Do you want to uh, come up to Minnesota and make a little bit of money at this? So, uh, you know, I was dumb and, and young and didn't really know what it took to be a professional fighter at that time. So, of course, I said yes and uh, went up there and got my ass kicked pretty good <laughs> and learned a thing or two. Uh, but I learned um, real quick what not to do. Yeah, and so take it serious. So uh, talking about that, some people might not know, but you actually wound up losing your first two pro fights. Both of them were in the first round. Then from there, you went on an eight fight winning streak. But uh, basically, everyone on that streak was in the first round, all but one. And um, what exactly, after losing those first two fights, made you get back in there? Especially, I saw you got back in just a month after losing that second fight. What changed and caused you to go on that winning streak that you had? Basically, when I fought my second fight, I went up and I fought uh, uh, Division Three. He was undefeated in college wrestling. His name is Marcus Levesseur. He ended up going on and fighting the UFC as well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he was uh, 15 and one as a professional at that time, and I was 0 and one. And uh, so I fought a I fought a little show back in Boone, and still like amateur because I could go up north and fight pro, and then I could come back back to Iowa and fight amateur. And uh, so I did that. I, I fought an amateur fight on a Friday night, and uh, they were looking for an opponent for him up in Minnesota for the following. So uh, I, I knocked my guy out uh, in, in, in an amateur show. I knocked that kid out pretty quickly, and uh, the promoter was like, "Hey, man, you want to come to Minnesota and uh, and basically fight this guy? Basically, just show up and get paid." You know? Yeah. I kind of knew. I kind of knew what it was. And I was getting fed to the sharks. I knew I wasn't ready to fight the kid, but uh, I was like, "Yeah, I, I'll just get in there. You know, I'll get in there and get get my paycheck." So uh, so I went up there basically knowing I was going to get my ass kicked, getting in the, 
I was going to get in the cage, and, uh, you know, the kid was going to be so much better than me. And I got in there, and I just remember he wasn't as tough as I, uh, everybody was building him up to be, you know. He was just a human, just the same. Um, I did end up losing that fight, but it showed me never again would I ever get in a fight with somebody and not take it seriously. Never would I ever count myself out in a fist fight with anybody. And uh, I think I really just um, was a point, the, the turning point for me. You know, I just realized that uh, this isn't the sport you want to dabble in. You know, if, you, if you're not taking it serious, you're going to get your ass kicked. So um, I did. That happened to me, and then uh, I, I took it serious. So it was more of a mindset thing for you, and it wasn't a training thing? Uh, no, I mean, not really. I, I wasn't training right in the beginning anyway. It was more, more or less just my heart, my, uh, my wrestling, my, my power punches. You know, I wasn't a technical striker, but I could hit hard. And uh, that's one attribute that I, I, I've been blessed with is, is, is a good heavy punch. So um, that's pretty much all I was relying on, man. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Uh, Nick, you have any questions up? Well, I wanted to ask you, your nickname is Hollywood. Where did that come from? Uh, it, it, People started calling me Hollywood around the regional circuit because, uh, you know, I was kind of a, I'm a, like a pretty boy looking kind of kid, you know, I'm not really like a big, you know, mean, fucking muscular looking fighter, you know, <laughs> yeah. just average looking, <laughs> and just maybe like, you know, what, you know, I, I don't know, pretty boy, I guess is what people would say. Um, that and mixed with my, uh, my flashy highlight reel, uh, like knockouts and finishes, and, uh, people just started calling me Hollywood. Nice. You can't have two pretty boys out there in alliance, huh? Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's right, man. That's right. Well, um, I also know um that you you trained out in Iowa for a while, and uh, but now you're in Alliance of all places, and so um, speaking of that, I wanted to ask you where did the what what happened to get you to transition to training over there, and how's it been training at Alliance thus far? Oh man, it's been awesome training at Alliance. It's been uh, you know, it's been up and down, just like the trans and growing pink with any gym, um, you know, plus everybody out here is, everybody out here is good, you know, there's no, there's no average good fighters out here, everybody's a fucking badass, so, uh, you know, that, that kind of took a, a little bit to transition to, but uh, now that, you know, we're in the sweat of things, everything's awesome, it's the best gym I've ever trained at, it's the best team I've ever had, and uh, just, I'm thinking to be a part of it. As far as, like, uh, how I got invited out to train with these guys, I was, uh, I, I was fighting in Iowa with RFA. I had a I had a fight with the RFA and Miles Jury just so happened to be in Iowa that week doing a jiu jitsu seminar and uh, he ended up coming by the fights and uh, saw the fight and we're just um, after that he uh, he got offered to fight Diego Sanchez and uh, he saw the fact I, I could switch it up I could fight Southpaw I could fight with the Docs and he, he wanted to use me as a as a training partner as a sparring partner you know come in and be and be the the new me on the market, so to say, you know. Um, so I went there and I just gave him my all. I, I gave him the best rounds I could every single time we sparred, and uh, I kind of gained his respect, gained the coach's respect, and and they um, they they invited me back to Will Ethan's camp when he fought Chris Watson. And uh, during that camp, I ended up getting signed with you, just myself, and the rest is history. Nice. Chris, you had anything? Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, just skipping straight to your UFC debut, you came in and uh, submitted Kazushi Tokadome with the guillotine choke in the second round. Uh, what was that like, and what was it like after? Because you wound up winning a performance of the night bonus after the event. I mean, that's huge, especially in your UFC debut. That's life-changing money right there for a young guy like you. That, I can't even I can't even begin to describe how, how my my UFC debut went, uh, you know how it went, dude. I I literally I literally sell everything I had back in Iowa just to pay for my camp. My wow. camp first fight. I remember you know having nothing, I mean, no car, or no nothing, no beds, everything I owned. And uh, and then on top of that, it was about one of the worst things I've ever had in my life. You know, I I, I got. Just knocked out, couldn't train for a week. I got a big cut on my eye, couldn't train for two weeks. I got a staff infection, couldn't train for two weeks. Holy shit. You know, so I I probably got about five or six days of good sparring in for that fight game. You know, because I was just constantly getting hurt or constantly getting skin funk or just it 
it was just nagging one thing after another, you know. Yeah. You know, on, on top of the fact, you know, I'm away from my kids and I, you know, I had to sell everything just to pay for this fucking camp. So, uh, so anyway, we get to Japan and it's fight week and I just, you know, I just remember thinking, you know, screw it. Like, if this guy, you know, if this guy was poking me in the chat, that's what would stop me from whooping his ass, you know? That ain't no different. In shape, not in shape, whatever. I'm, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna fight. And, uh, I, and I did, man. I just went out there. There was no pressure. It was, it was honestly the, the funnest fight I've ever had in my life. I just went out there, no pressure, didn't care about anybody or anything. I just knew what I had to do. I just had to go out and I had to take care of business the way I take care of business. And, uh, and, and I knew if I did that, then, then I, I would get the outcome I was looking for. Dude, that just sounded like the worst fight camp possible I've ever heard of in my life. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I was rough, man. It was rough. <laughs> So, like, exactly, what, what were you thinking? Like, you're at the post-fight press conference, and you hear Dana White announce the performance in the night bonuses, and he says your name. What are you, what are you, what are you thinking? Man, it was, I mean, it was, I, I would, I, would, I almost want to say it was, like, I didn't believe it, but, like, I, I, I believed it, and I knew it was happening. It was just a really, really, really grateful feeling. I was just just grateful, just really grateful. That's all. I mean, that's, that's the best word that describes it. Really, I mean, you know, I wasn't. Oh um, yeah, I won it. Oh, you know, I wasn't all pumped up. I wasn't. All, yeah. You know, I, I was just, I was just really thankful, and I just, you know, I just was just really grateful for it. What did yeah, you end up uh, spending your money on, if that's okay to ask? Oh, it's still in the bank, bro. Nice. Smart man. That's a rainy day. Yeah, that's a rainy day fund. Nice. <laughs> Well, talk back to those nice. Well, I wanted to also ask you since um, a jury seems to be a very influential part of wh of where you're at now. Uh, I also see here that you're a purple belt in jury jujitsu, so that means you train under him in jujitsu. Yeah. Yes. Yep. I am. Talk to us about that. I I didn't even know jury was doing that. <laughs> That he was that yeah, he had his own belting young. system and and jujitsu style that he was training people in. Yeah, he 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 is, and he actually um he's doing he goes around to, and does seminars and uh, you know he I think he has a couple uh, he has a couple I think Jeremy Stevens is under him as well. Uh, don't quote me on that, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I mean he goes around and uh, he has his own style and uh, his own ranking system and. And, um, yeah, I mean, he, he's been at it for uh, a couple of years now. Wow. How do you, what do you think about him as an instructor? Uh, I just, I mean, I, I think it's like we're, we're similar body types and, uh, we're similar styles when it comes to grappling. Uh, we do a lot of things, a lot of the things that works for him well, works for me pretty well. So I just, uh, just the similarities of, uh, of how we fight with our, with our ground game is, uh, is, is what I really drive about, about, uh, about jury style. Ooh. Anybody at a alliance that you train with specifically on your striking end? Because it's obvious that it's, it's improved uh, a high amount since your early days. Yeah, I mean, it, my striking coach is the best. Adrian Melendez, you know, coach Coach Eric Del Piero, um, they, they, they get you where you need to be for flight time, you know. Uh, but as far as my sparring partners go, I mean, man, you take your pick, you know. I mean, you got Don Cruz, you got Jeremy Stevens, Miles Jury, Michael Chandler. I mean, I mean, you know, Ross Pearson, Norman Clark. You know, I mean, and, and that's and that's just the guys that people know about. You know, there's guys, you know, coming up in, in the smaller, a little bit smaller shows, you know, and uh, and they're just as good, you know, if not better. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, any, any, it, there's no shortage for a good sparring partner, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I could imagine that that gym is packed with a bunch of talent, up and coming, and guys that are already established in the UFC. And uh, uh, this question's a little bit out of the blue, but I just realized you're six foot one. You fight at lightweight. That's a pretty sizable lightweight. Would um, have you ever thought about moving to welterweight? Have you ever had trouble making lightweight, or has it just been easy cut for you? Yeah, I fought welterweight once in my professional career. Um, I ended up I fought a kid when I was eighteen. For a strike force contract. Anyway, he ended up winning that fight. I got the rematch. I won the rematch, but I ended up breaking my foot, breaking my hand, and breaking my nose, which kind of put me out for about three months or so. During those three months, all only I did three months. Was drink beer, <laughs> eat food. 
sit around. So uh, I ended up shooting up to about 200, 210 pounds. Damn. And uh, <laughs> my first fight back, I, I, I there was just no way I could get the weight off the time. So I ended up having to take the fight at welterweight. Well, uh, <laughs> let's just say I learned right away I'm not a welterweight. I came out and <laughs> lit the kid up. I mean, lit the kid up. Punched him in the face as hard as I could. And he literally just grabbed me by the shoulders and threw me to the ground. <laughs> and and that was when I knew I wasn't a welterweight. It was just a schoolyard, I, schoolyard I beatdown. Yeah, I ended up kicking his ass. I ended up reversing him and getting on top of him and, and uh, finishing with a TKO, I believe. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, had that guy been better or had the right mind to whoop my ass, I think he would have. <laughs> this big boy. Was this Jeremy Castro? <laughs> no, it was... Uh, uh, you know, I can't feel the life of me think of his name right now. Um, EJ, no, not EJ Brooks, but uh, ah, it, it, it's whatever. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not talk about him, but yeah. Do you ever have trouble making lightweight at all now, or is it just easy? No, I mean, it sucks. It always sucks. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I walk about 185 pounds. Maybe, oh. you know, I get up to about 190 sometimes. Uh, wow. Pretty, you know, it's, it's, that's place yeah. in T-Bow territory yeah. right there. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it's easy because I know how to do it, but it's hard because it, it sucks. I mean, it, it, it never for any fun to do. But, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I get down pretty relatively easy. Have you ever missed weight at 55? I have never missed weight, knock on wood. Um, nice. I, I, I have shown up to a fight where uh, – there was an issue with my scale. My scale was off a couple pounds, so I showed up to uh, the weigh-ins uh, two pounds over, I believe it was, and I had to make scratch 55. Um, and and uh, I, but I ended up making it uh, about two hours, about two and a half, three hours later. I ended up making weights. So no, I, I I've never messed weight, and I, I don't believe in that. I I feel that's the mandatory job description. You show up on weight and you show up to fight. You can't do those things, then you don't belong signing the contract in the first place. No. Yeah, you could give some of these other guys a lesson because you're cutting a shitload of weight and yeah. seems like, like you're making it pretty well. Yeah, I mean, no. Ain't no, ain't no uh, room in the sport for a bunch of pussies. You, know? <laughs> you, either do it, you do it or you don't. You know, you don't make excuses. I wanted to ask you, Johnny, that, um, I mean, you, you obviously have this very exciting, high-paced octane style, and, and uh, but you have a very high finishing rate with 18 finishes out of 20 wins. What do you attribute that high finishing rate to? Pressure I bring and just the, the the power that I that I have in my hands, you know. Um, I I know how to push the pace to make it grueling, and I know how to hit people hard and, and to make them question themselves, make them question whether or not they can stay in the fight. And uh, if I hit them in the mouth and they're still conscious, they're 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 definitely wanting me to knock them out. You know, they're not wanting to stay there and take take punches for three rounds. Um, I think that's really just it. You know, I just I get in there and I set a, I set a pace and. Uh, and I, and I fight like nobody wants to fight, you know, for three rounds. And I don't blame them, you know. Yeah. I mean, another thing I wanted to ask, you don't have a fight lined up that we know of. Any uh, any any fight that you have going on in the works that you're trying to get signed? Anybody you want to fight in particular? Yeah, I want to fight Frank Trevino. He, uh, he was supposed to be a fill-in for me when uh, Paul Felder uh, – and I were originally supposed to fight. Paul Felder ended up fighting with Danny Garcia, and uh, then I was supposed to fight Trevino. And he had an injury or whatever, pushed out, and I ended up fighting at uh, at Kids, New Jersey. Um, but after that yeah. fight, he had the ball to get on Twitter, and you know, it, it called me out that he was going to knock me out and all that. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'd like to uh, I'd like to shut him up. And uh, Mexico City from Mexico City is coming up, you know, and he's from. Uh, you know, he's a Mexican fighter, so I feel like that makes sense. And let's do it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, now, right now, you're two and all in the UFC after you just won your last fight by TKO. Um, when are you looking to get back in there? I mean, when's the Mexico City card that you want to get on against? Them? That's uh, in uh, like uh, in June. And, uh, yeah, it's in my June. My birthday would be two weeks following, so I think that would be a nice mm-hmm. early birthday present. You know, and it uh, give me time to uh, enjoy myself, enjoy my family, and. And to not have to be training through my uh, through my birthday, so I think timeline is about is about as good as it can get. And Mexico City was pretty awesome. I, I went there uh, for the Mark Hunt and um, Verdun card, and those fans were awesome. Just the, just the the energy that they had, and, and 
in, in the charisma that they showed the fighters was just it was just unlike any place I've ever been. So I think that'd be an awesome fighting card to be on. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like it's a really good atmosphere out there. And I mean, how would you wind up uh, accumulating to the getting used to the atmosphere out there and the elevation? Because I know it's a lot higher than usual. Would you go out there and train early if you got the fight out there? Nah, there's a couple tricks you can do to uh, to help with uh, the elevation. You know, there's tents. You know, you can get elevation tents. You can sleep in. That kind of helps. A uh, uh, big thing is a uh, beach juice. Beet juice it, it ups the uh, the oxygen level in your blood in your bloodstream, which which is you know what you need for high elevation too. So I mean, there's 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 a ton of tricks you can do. Um, I'm not really too worried about it. My my cardio has never been a bit of a problem in the past, you know, and uh, I don't I don't foresee it being a problem in yeah. elevation or whatever. You know, I don't foresee it being a problem. Awesome, awesome. Nick. Do you have any other? You can cut off. You can cut all that weight and not have cardio issues. You're a scary dude, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never had problems. I'm like, I've always been ready to fight. I've always been in shape and uh, just ready to do my job description. Go three rounds or five rounds if I need to. I wanted to ask you also because there was obviously a lightweight title fight two weeks ago. Um, what did you think of that uh, title victory on Rafael dos Anjos' part? I think I was pretty crazy, man. Uh, I think he, he he knew what he had to do to beat Pettis, and uh, he did, and he did it impressively. Um, yeah, I mean, it was up to him, you know. It, it, it's crazy. My my boy Jeremy Stevens got a, a brutal highlight knockout on that on that guy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but since then, you know, you can tell he's really put in the work. You know, you can tell physically he's big. He, he's an athlete. You know, he, he in the beginning of his career, he was kind of just you know a skilled fighter. wasn't wasn't too strong. wasn't too uh, you know. Athletic. He was just kind of an average guy when it came to the, the physical attributes, but he was a good fighter. Now you have the world class level of fighter, you know, plus he's an athlete, so he's a monster. So I mean, you can tell he's been putting in the work. You can tell uh, he's been taking it serious, and he's been gunning for that title. You know, I mean, kudos to him. You know. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Before we get out of here, we wanted to ask you also, like, what? Um, as far you're in the lightweight division, probably, arguably, the most competitive division. Um, what are your goals uh, in the UFC now that you're there? You have two fights under your belt. You have a you have a lot of momentum behind you. What's the goal? Uh, I don't really have a, like a goal per se. I just kind of have uh, a direction. You know, um, I, I, I like to say you know the lightweight division. It is the the most uh, stacked division, and, it, and that keeps me humble. But at the same time, it. Uh, it gives you room to uh, to improve and gives you uh, gives you time to develop correctly, you know. And as far as my goals, you know, I'm just gonna just gonna keep doing what I do and uh, keep surprising myself. See where I end up. <laughs> awesome, man. I really we just want to thank you for coming on. Do you have anyone you wanted to shout out or anything you wanted to say? And where can people find you on social media? Yeah, yeah, you guys uh, hit me up on uh, Twitter and hit me up on Instagram, like Hollywood Case. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank all my friends, all my family, and all my uh, my fans, you know, that, that that support me. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have a job. You know, doing what I do wouldn't be as great as it is. So thank you. Even the haters, you know, even the, even the people hate me. I mean, that's still that's motivation. That's uh, that's energy that 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 I feed off of. That's energy that makes me better and. Uh, Let's me know I'm doing the right thing. So, uh, yeah, just thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys for having me on the show today. I appreciate it. No problem, man. We really appreciate you coming on and taking the time out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Johnny. We appreciate you so much. Uh, can't wait to see you back in there. You're an exciting fighter to watch. And, uh, oh, man, uh, I would love to see you on the Mexican card. Yeah. Nothing but exciting. Yeah. Uh, for Thanks, me, <laughs> for me, it's always the Hispanic fighters throw, throw on great fights already. And um, I, I feel like uh, an exciting fighter like yourself could could uh, have some fireworks with somebody on that card. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm the kind of fighter, you know, I, I like to get in there and I like to be dominant. And I like to do uh, my own thing. But, yeah. uh, you know, I'm no stranger to gritty fights. I've been in fights where I've had to, you know, dig down deep and I've had to really question whether or not I can uh, keep going. And so I know, I'm, I know what I'm capable of. Uh, I know being in the UFC – I'm going to have fights like that, and uh, and I embrace that. I look, look forward to that. You know, hopefully every one of my fights is going to knock down, drag out, you know, but uh, 
But yeah, I mean, the, fan, the fans like to see gritty fights, and I want to be an entertainer. I want to put on fights fans remember. I want people to talk about me and think, yeah, that's, that's a bad motherfucker right there. <laughs> well, you have it's shown fun, that man. so far. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, dude, for coming on. We appreciate you, Case. Thank and, you, uh, guys. Yeah, we would I love to have you on time. again if you're ever available. Oh, definitely. A- absolutely. I'd love to be on there, guys. Just let me know. Yeah, definitely. We'll hit you up. Um, I'm going to follow you on Twitter right now, and we'll let you know when the podcast is up, and I'm going to have a written interview up soon, too. Outstanding. All right, man. I appreciate it. All right. Mm-hmm. Thanks, man. Bye. Good. Thanks, thanks. And that was Johnny Hollywood Case, and that was a great interview. That guy, legit and real. Yeah. If you haven't seen him point. fight, fight fans, please go ahead and look him up. Uh, he's got exciting finishes, exciting style, and I can't wait to see him in there. Personally, uh, it's just me and Chris Pagman today. How you doing, dude? How's things good? Been? That was yeah. a fun interview. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that event that happened this past Saturday, UFC Fight yeah. Night 62, Meyer versus LaFlair. Um, there was a lot of great, uh, exciting uh, fights, a lot of finishes. It yeah, was a great card. card. Five yeah. or six finishes, main card. No, nah, nine finishes. Oh, on the main card. Yeah, main yeah, card, yeah. Main card, main card. Yeah. That was a great uh, event in total. Uh, the very first fight on the card, I'm going to look his name up because I need to know. Because, uh, uh, Siler versus Serrano. Serrano. What's his name? Frankie? Frankie Serrano? Freddie. Freddie Serrano? That uppercut knockout. Oh, I saw that. Holy I, shit. I didn't see the fight as it happened, but I saw a replay. Yeah, I was watching the fight, and and Serrano, it was like one round apiece going into that last round, but Serrano had a much more dominating win of a round. Um, but yeah, that uppercut. Man, that was crazy. I was... I mean, yeah, that yeah. that was one of the more legit flyweight knockouts I've seen since um, Dodson. Uh, Dodson, no, not not even or Dodson and who? Dodson knocked out um, who the hell? What was that he knocked out? Who do you know? Oh I yeah, don't Formiga. I Formiga. About, talking about DJ versus Benavidez. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. But Dodson versus Formiga. That was another good knockout. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, there's there's not too many of those, but that was a great now. He went, he just flatlined once he hit, once he got hit with that uppercut, Bentley Siler. Yeah, that was legit. That was a great fight. And then uh, like, so, I know we're probably gonna just talk about the main card because there aren't really. Well, many. let's talk about let's talk about one thing that happened wanted, on the prelims. Yeah, no, this is what I was about to say. I wanted to talk about the Silver Dover. It's the uh, the robbery of the century right there. That was so bad. I I, I have a headache right now. It was so bad. Dude, Literally. Like, I didn't, I didn't watch any of the prelims, but I saw the replay of this, and that was the most egregious refereeing I've ever seen in my life. But, yeah, crazy. for anybody that didn't see, Leandro Silva uh, was getting – was a Dauber goes for a takedown after some grappling going on. There was a scramble. There was space th- uh, space there for Dauber, so he went for a takedown. Leandro then uh, fell back for a guillotine attempt, he tries to get the choke in. Dauber defends well properly by getting yeah, into the half guard. Uh, yeah. Yeah, half guard. Yeah, he goes into the half guard, and uh, and so anybody that does jujitsu will know that you can't legitimately choke somebody out from that position unless you're just extremely strong, like excessively, like Matt Hughes strong. Yeah, you might be able to finish a dodge from there, but you're not finishing a, a guillotine. Yeah, I mean, you just have to be stupid strong to really finish somebody from there. And it didn't even look like Leandro was really applying too much pressure there. It seemed more so he was just kind of keeping his head there than anything. Yeah. And, uh, and then so he's in the half guard, and his head's in there, and you can see him working the hands, trying to get the, trying to break the grip so he can, you know, be free. And then out of nowhere, he pops his head out too, like at the like, same time. Right as right as the ref decides, at, I don't know what the decision was based on, but he moves in. It looked like he was talking to Dauber, saying something, and maybe Dauber just didn't respond to him or something, and he fin- decided to stop the fight from there. That's the only le- like le- legitimate thing that I can think of as to why he would just jump in like that. Dude, he just like, he, this guy is His head was popping out, right, as he stopped the fight. his head out, and yeah. he just out of nowhere. Oh, fight's over. And I, oh. Dude, I don't I think this, this is, is this the same ref that was, uh... This is the same ref that... Munoz got choked? 
I don't know if it's the same ref. Munoz got choked, but this is the same ref earlier in the night where Christos Giagos was submitting a guy named Jorge de Oliveira, and he was tapping excessively, like he tapped like five times hard on the dude's leg before the refs before that ref stopped it. So he stopped one too late, and then he stops one that shouldn't even have been stopped, both in one night. That's horrible. Yo, Brazil gotta get a commission. <laughs> they what? Well, I mean. Not only that, they, I mean, I think they do, but they have like uh, it's it doesn't work the way that American commissions do. All right, they gotta get a better. They gotta fire that guy. They can't. They can't, yeah, he just really. no. No, that's that's bad. He like, needs to go back to the. Game. He needs to go back to the minor leagues. He really Dude, does. That Dober fight should be overturned because that was. Miserable. If there if there was ever a case for a fight that should be overturned, that was it. Yeah, definitely. That's like I mean that was such a bad call. I couldn't even think like I was thinking like of all the bad calls that there have been, it's really hard to think of anyone that was as bad as that. The only one I could think of that was near as bad as it was um, Kim Winslow when she she allowed Larkin to get hit with way too many shots by King Mo and Strikeforce. Okay. Um, that's the only thing I could think of. Another person tried to make the case for Eric Silva and uh, Carlo Prater when they fought in Brazil and in, in Silva's second fight. With the DQ call because he was hitting, hitting him supposedly in the back of the head. That it's not it's it's way worse than that. The the only way you can measure it to that is if Eric Silva knocked the dude out and kept hitting him in the face and, and the ref called it DQ because he was hitting him in the back of the head. That's how bad it need to be for you to measure it up to how bad this was. There was no tap. There was no submission. There was no uh, as far as we could tell, Dober didn't say anything to to the ref that said yeah. hey I'm out or anything. I, mean, I don't even know what to say. I mean, it was just really weird, and uh, not much else to say about that one. It was just bad. Yeah, Leandro was being very awkward about it. He oh, was yeah, like, he was, oh, so he was out. He went limp on me. Uh, you know, I was yeah. uh, uh-uh. calm down. I mean, first of all, he yeah. probably wasn't going limp. He was probably just allowing his body to relax since he was on top. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's really that's odd. It is. It's silly. I hope right. that they get a rematch, oh. and I hope this gets turned into a no let's, contest. Let's move on to the main card. Yeah. Uh, uh, Fredo Pepe versus Andre Feely. That didn't last too long. No, nah, it didn't. First round submission by uh, Pepe, who's looked good now. That's his third uh, finish, I believe, straight. Um, that's three victories in a row now. Um, he's looked great. I think it's time to bring him to the States, see what he could do. Um, and, you know, because I think his last three fights have been in only Brazil. And I don't know if that's because he just can't fight out here, but we'll see what that's about. Let me see. Has he fought in the yeah. U.S.? Has he fought in the U.S.? I don't know. Since, um, since his sure. time in the UFC, I want to know. Let's see. Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. Brazil. I'm actually Brazil. I'm yeah. a bit surprised at the outcome of this. I didn't think it was going to turn out that way. Yeah, I mean, Philly's uh, – I mean, that's a that's a legit submission for sure. Yeah. Goto Frito Pepe has never fought outside of Brazil. Yeah. I mean – That could be a visa issue, but – Yeah, possibly or just Brazilian and they like to put him there. He likes to fight there. It could make sense. But – um. Just talking about the fight in general, it was a quick submission. He caught a triangle, uh, which Feely was fighting off submission attempts, and then he got caught in that, and it was basically over from there. But I, I don't know. Feely seemed like he was a pretty good hot prospect. He was when he came into the UFC, he looked good. He beat uh, Jeremy Larson by TKO. He lost to Max Holloway, which is understandable. Yeah. And he well, he trains at a great fight. camp. He trains at Team Alpha Male, and uh... yeah, he trains at Alpha Male. He was basically he had one loss in his whole career coming into the UFC and now he's lost two of his last three and he both well he's two and two in the UFC yeah so um but yeah I mean this was a close fight to call from the beginning but man to go to to get a flying triangle choke is pretty impressive yeah definitely (laughs) I liked it one of my favorite finishes uh the next fight on the card Gilbert Burns um and Alex Oliveira I was uh I was having I was talking with Adam well the MMAD uh, Adam and Jonas about this fight and I was very big on Gilbert, and um, what'd you say? This was a fun fight. Oh, definitely. Alex Oliveira brought it in that first round. I mean, there wasn't a fight in a night given out, but this could have won it. Um, oh yeah. Alex Oliveira came out strong, hit Burns with a lot of hard shots in that first round, kind of slowed it down, but still won that second round. So I think yeah. Burns was two rounds in the hole in that third round, and then um, in the third round he had this. He 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 kept trying for this omoplata and. Uh, 
Yeah, he just, held it in for a while. I, I was freaking out. I was like, okay, okay. I was like trying to coach him, and I know he can't hear me. Yeah, I wanted him to get normal water. It was looking, it was looking pretty he good. He had it. All he really right needed off. to do was get that left hand across the the, uh, the other side of his head and then just kind of push yeah, himself yeah. forward. He had it, yeah, he had it figure forward, and uh, Oliveira kept grabbing onto his foot, which was kind of preventing him from finishing and scooting him, pulling him out all the way. Yeah, but that's, that's why I was trying to, you know – I, that's why I was hoping that he would just get that left hand because he was on his right. He was attacking his Do you right think arm. If he would have adjusted his feet and just turned him out the other way, he would have been able to finish it. Yeah, well, he would have had more balance if he had done what I was uh, trying to say, which is trying to get his left hand because he was uh, he was attacking the right arm, right? Yeah. So he what he would have need, what he should have done is gone his left hand, reached across the other side of his head, which is the left side, reached across. And then tried and balanced himself, and then pushed, and then like basically yanked at his uh, at his neck mainly, mainly to push himself forward, so that way he puts more crank on the arm, as well as adjusting his feet. Yeah, but not too much, because otherwise he could have lost the arm. It's a very. Oh, yeah. it, it was certainly he was certainly in a position where he could have finished from there, but it, there was a lot going on, and he was defended yeah. well. I, I you there know, were a I'll, lot of scrambles there. He looked for. A I think a triangle at one point, and then he yeah, the and then he finishes on the last minute of the fight, and I yeah. oh, oh, oh. it was such a great performance. Finish. I'm high on this guy now. I can't wait to see him get in there again. And, yeah, and I, I knew like that too he, going in I there. I knew someone tweeted. I don't remember who exactly because I don't want to take credit for it. But um, they are like Gilbert Burns' jujitsu is like Dan Henderson's uh, right hand, even when he's losing the fight. He can come out and finish it at any point. Yeah, I mean, going into that, Gilbert Burns has competed in a lot of Brazilian uh, jiu-jitsu tournaments, gotten gold, and, and won a lot of uh, has a lot of accolades in jiu-jitsu. So that's why I was very high on him going into this fight, and thought that he could uh, that he that he could get the submission. Sure enough, I was right, and um, it was, yeah, that was a great fight. And uh, Alvera put on a great fight himself. We just got a uh, you know yeah he, he stayed down there too long with him. Last minute of the fight, seconds too. Left in the Yeah, he just yeah. needed to survive 45 more seconds. He would have uh, gotten the win for sure. Um, but Gilbert Burns, that comeback, man, that was a great fight. I was, yeah, it would be interesting to see where he goes from there. But uh, moving on to the next fight, it was another really quick one. Oh, yeah, man. Oh. Amanda Nunez versus Dang. Shayna Baszler. Now, I mean, it's not like – Dude, that was, a, that was a ass-kicking if I ever saw one. Yeah, and I kind of, kind of all felt that coming. Shayna Baszler just has not been. She, it seems like she's gotten in there. She's forgotten how to fight. It seems. Yeah, is she just like old now? So I don't even she's know. She's thirty four, and she's been in the game for eleven years. You know, um, and that's unfortunate. I, I just think it's it's around her time where she should maybe call it quits. I think. Yeah, yeah. she's on a three fight losing streak now, and she lost two fights by TKO in the UFC. Yeah. She yeah. hasn't looked so good. She hasn't. She's won one fight of her last five. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, she's an exciting personality for sure. But I mean, there's just these women in the game right now, like Nunez, who's 25, who's just yeah. who's in her, who's not even at her prime yet, and has already looked sensational. Gave Katz and Gano a run for her money, you know. Yeah, um, it doesn't seem like uh, Shayna Baszler can compete with any of the top 15, 20 girls in the division anymore. Yeah, and I don't mean to say this like Invicta is a feeder league or anything, but I, I mean if she wants to continue fighting, I think she should try her hand there because yeah. I think UFC's 135 division is just too too much. Um, yeah, I it's agree. got too many dangerous characters, you know. Because I mean, the thing about Invicta is that it holds a lot of uh, 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 interesting fighters, but they they know that they've given quite a, a few of their best. Uh, they literally fed their whole division to the UFC when they got when they got the 135ers and then just started over. So yeah, I mean, um, did Basil even land a strike in the fight? Like is she landed two punches? Yeah. What? She landed two punches and a kick. Dude, I mean, she barely landed anything. She, she landed three total torn, strikes. Yeah. She was getting torn apart. Like she got leg kicked a few times pretty hard. She got body kicked really hard one time. She got pieced up in the face a few times by a few punches and then. What finished the fight, it looked like she might have hurt her knee there. She got leg kicked really hard right in the knee. Yeah, there could, if she could have gotten seriously injured, and we'll find out in the next coming days. Because that's the first time, we don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure if she's... Because those are some hard strikes that Amanda Nunes was throwing out there. And it that's how that chick fight fights. It's just, what was that? Yeah, that's just how that chick fights. Amanda Nunes is, is like, uh, it's, you know... She, she comes she, out strong. She's basically like a, a female Tiago Alves. She yeah. attacks really aggressively, and um, 
you know, with her kickboxing. Yeah. I'm looking at the fight stats right now. It says Shannon Baszler landed one of eight strikes, zero of two on takedown attempts. Amanda Nunes landed 17 of 20 and 15 of 17 oh, significant. Geez. Maybe that's, Nunez blocked those two punches that I saw then, I guess. I don't know. That's bad. Yeah, it is bad. Nunez is, is a legit fighter, though. And she, she's she's got all finishes in all her fights. She's 3 and 1 now. That's uh, With three finishes, that's crazy. All of them in the first round, too. Wow. <laughs> wow. She's a dangerous girl, man. That's crazy. And uh, she has three losses. One to Alexis Davis by TKO, which is actually surprising. Um, Anne Marie, isn't that Rhonda's mom? Is <laughs> 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 literally she lost her very first fight to an Anne Marie. Um, and then a Sarah Dialo, uh, Di Alio. Uh, I don't even know if I said that right. Di Alio. Di Alio, yeah. Di Al, no Alelio. All right, stop. But, yeah, I give, up, I give up. I give up. I give up. I'm sorry, woman. <laughs> but yeah, ten wins, nine nine knockouts, and one submission. She hasn't. She's she's only gone to the decision once, and lost that one. Yeah, she lost to Zingano. No, that wasn't a decision. That was a Zingano she TKO. Had to TKO by Zing yeah. Zingano. Yeah. The decision was, I think, was to that chick whose last name I can't say. All right. So I mean, yeah, she's looking pretty good. They could definitely give her someone in ranked again. Definitely. And we're going to talk about later on about that division, but we'll move on to the next fight. Leonardo Santos versus Tony Martin. Now, Tony Martin was another guy who I was very uh, high on going into this fight. He trains at ATT. Uh, very, a lot of jiu-jitsu credentials uh, for himself. Santos didn't have any that I could find. But, um, man, uh, he took a, took full advantage of the grappling department in that fight. Isn't he a world champion? Is he? I couldn't find it. I don't know. I remember them talking about his... Let's see. Going into the fight. Let's see. I'm looking at it again. Yeah, so am I. Started training jiu-jitsu at age five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think this is fair to say he's a black belt if we can't find it. But I already know you want to. But <laughs> Tony, Ma yeah, he's uh, got. Well, I see it right now on Wikipedia. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Championships, four-time World Cup champion, silver world medalist. Bronze world medalist, ADCC Brazilian trial champion, fourth place in the ADCC finals. I think I was, I think I was a little too high on Tony Martin here. Yeah, I mean, I picked Santos going into this fight. I thought he'd come away with the submission, but Tony Martin looked good. He looked decent on the ground. He looked good standing up. He was a lot bigger and stronger than Santos, but when Santos was able to get the fight down, he took control, finished it. Yeah. That was a great performance overall. Sant, uh, did Santos get a performance? I don't think he did. Yeah, see, I, I don't, I'm not too sure on that. But Gilbert Burns, oh, here, here's who I know got it. Gilbert Burns, Castro, oh, Souza for the knockout against Castanori yeah, in the first. What about Eric Silva? And then, no, nah, Eric Silva didn't get one. Freddie Serrano also got one, the guy with the uppercut. Uh, yeah. yeah, Silva was denied. All right, so Speaking of which, about Eric Silva, yeah. he's going to his fight with Josh Goschek. Speaking of, now that's kind of sad. You just see at the end of that fight, Koscheck was like, "Damn." Dude, I mean, it. at least Koscheck put up a little bit of. A yeah, fight. he came out aggressive. He really tried he to. He was really aggressive. He got in there, so his face was looking to get the fight to the mat. Kept which is into which him, has worked for some fight. in the past, yeah. He definitely tried to make it a dirty fight, and he he didn't look as bad as he has, but he didn't look good. He got rocked a few times. He was getting caught with some really good shots. Yeah, he got dropped like once or twice. He got hit with two really good shots. Um, yeah, I mean, he wasn't catching him in the stand-up, so it was a very back-and-forth round. But then he made the same mistake he made against Jake Ellenberger. He had his head up too high when he put him against the cage. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and, and so that left his neck out there, and then point, Silva attacked with the guillotine. Before that, once he got dropped, he went for a desperate uh, takedown from there when he got dropped, and then that would led to the finish. Yeah, well... Did he get dropped? I know he got hit, and then he, uh, you know, got, got went for a takedown and, and turned him against, against the cage. Down. Yeah. And then once they were up against the cage, Eric Silva went for that guillotine. and Koscheck went for the underhook, but you Silva just turned it into an arm in and finished it pretty quickly. Yeah, that was unfortunate. I mean, it's better to see Koscheck getting choked out than knocked out at this point. 
But still, I, I think he. I don't think he has what it takes to be competing with the uh, high level guys anymore. Yeah, and this was his last fight of his UFC contract, and now um, Dana himself has said, if Koshek isn't thinking about it, I'm going to talk to him about it. I think he should do it. Um, Koshek himself retired, hasn't yeah. hasn't come out and said that uh, he's going. I mean, to retire. I don't think he wants to fight in Bellator or anything like that. So if the UFC yeah. doesn't resign him, that was how many? He broke the record for most fights in U- in UFC welterweight history. I think it was 25. 25. Oh shit! Really? Something he came like into the that. UFC when he was two and zero, oh. <laughs> and now wow. he's uh and so yeah, let's look at his record. And so now he's he was two and zero oh when he came in. Now he's seventeen and ten, so he has a fifteen and ten record in the UFC. Yeah, that's twenty five. Yeah, it's something like that. It might not be exactly twenty five, but I I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, no, he's seventeen and ten, so that should be it. That's crazy. He's had a career, man. He certainly has yeah. a very up and down one. But uh, it's been exciting watching him fight. If that was his last fight, uh, you know, and kudos to him for taking another fight on three weeks' notice. He's done that before. He took Matt Hughes on three weeks' notice. Um, and so you know, I would just hope whatever is up uh, is next for him. Uh, good luck, and if he does come back, uh, I I won't pre- specifically think it's a good idea. I think that he shouldn't fight anybody ranked or anybody near rankings right now. Yeah, I don't. I think it's his time to get out of this. He's been doing it for a really long time. He's been he's been in this since UFC uh, since Ultimate Fighter one. That's a really long time to be fighting. And I mean, I wish him all the best. I hope he made a good living in the UFC. And if he needs to, hopefully they'll give him a job inside the organization, and he'll be able to live his life. Yeah, eleven years. Two thousand four January was his first fight. Yeah, man. Let's see. Yeah, he had 17 wins, five by knockout, five by submission, seven decisions. So he had more finishes than decisions. Going and closing out his uh, career, if this is it, very impressive. Yeah, definitely. Move on to the main event. Um, well, actually, who does she think Silva should fight next? Eric Silva. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I personally I, wouldn't be opposed I, to seeing him and Stephen Thompson going at it. No, that would be pretty cool. Uh, is Thompson booked? No. He was booked to fight Thatch, and uh, and then I uh, hurt his rib. But he he said on his Twitter that he recently that he was uh, looking for another fight, uh, for some reason in Mexico, which I don't understand. But yeah, that would make sense. They could give him Stephen Thompson. They could give him someone ranked if they would like to. Uh, he, I don't know. This who is Tarek Safadine fighting? Does he have a fight? I don't know. I don't think he does. Let's see. You have a computer, right? You look it up. Oh, here he is. While I'm looking that up, talk about the main event. Well, that was a great main event, in my opinion. And I know a lot of people weren't in completely impressed. The last two rounds were kind of uh, busty. But Maya came in strong, man. He came in aggressive, not only trying to strike with him, but he, he, he really went for takedowns and got him and got LaFleur down more times than, than LeFleur could stop him. So Maya came out aggressive, strong. Uh, when he got into the mount, more t- and kudos to LeFleur for being able to defend so many uh, takedown attempts. Yeah, I don't see Safadine having a fight. Scheduled. I'm looking yeah. right now. I, I don't think he has a fight, so maybe they can do that. Silva Safadine? That makes sense, actually. Yeah, I like that fight. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of options at welterweight. You could do a Stephen Thompson, because the winner of that would probably get put into the top 15. Um, I don't know. There's a few fights out there. Yeah. Maybe you give him Ellenberger. Maybe. Yeah, Ellenberger is like in, from 11 to 15. I don't know where he's at right now. I think he's like maybe he's 11. 11. He's 11? Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I like that. Uh, Silva has a lot of good options. He's always exciting to watch, so I, I'd like, I can't wait to see him again. Personally, going into this event, I actually thought it'd be more exciting if Eric Silva was fighting Damian Maia. I think that's a more sellable fight for a main event. Yeah, or even Costa. Oh, go ahead. They could do that in Brazil for sure. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. This is a fight in Brazil. Pit two badass Brazilians against each other. I thought it would have been alright. Plus, yeah, um, um, just talking about the main event here, just going back to it, mm-hmm. I actually didn't really get to catch it. I caught the highlights because I wound up falling asleep. It got pretty late. It got to like 12.30 and I just knocked out. So and you I couldn't hang in Brazil. You know what time it was yeah. out there? <laughs> Dude, I know. But I, I just, I didn't, 
didn't have it recorded or anything because I, I was watching live. So, but just looking at the stats and from the highlights, I saw that Maya looked pretty good on the ground, like he always does. And I thought Lafleur might be able to use his wrestling, stay on top, and then if he wanted to keep it standing, just keep it standing and have the advantage. But looking at the stats right now, it looked like they threw the exact same amount of punches, and Maya outstruck Lafleur in significant end total strikes and. Well, that's because they had the strikes on the ground, and he hit them a lot yeah, on the ground. Yeah, that's probably exactly what happened. I didn't see that. And then um, takedowns, it looks like LaFleur went for zero takedowns, and Maya landed 5-14. And I saw he went for a few submission attempts, look, looked good on the ground like he always does. And, I mean, it might have been a little bit too much for LaFleur too soon. Yeah, and I thought it wouldn't be, you know what I mean? I thought Le this was LaFleur's time to really show everything that he's got because he's, he, he really hasn't shown too many weaknesses in a lot of his very impressive performances, like uh, Court McGee being the biggest win that he has thus far. Yeah, and he looked really good against John Howard in his last fight. Yeah, he's looked great. And so, I mean, that, this was the first time where he looked really, you know, uh, where he was shown weakness, and obviously in the takedown department or because he got taken down – a lot by at least yeah, once per five round. Times. I thought he, yeah, yeah, he basically got taken down once per round. The first round, once he got taken down, Maya stayed on top of him until the belt run. And then, uh, same yeah, I didn't think happened. Maya'd be able to get him down like that. Me neither. I really didn't. I know Maya has good takedowns, but I didn't think that he'd be able to take Lafleur down, a guy who trains yeah, his wrestling exactly. with guys like Bermudez out in New York with a lot of good wrestlers. You know? Oh yeah, trains out of my area with a bunch of guys out here. Yeah, I was and, very surprised. Um, Looking at the control stats, that's the most eye-popping one. Maya had 13 a minutes, 46 seconds of control, while LaFleur only had a minute 25. That's big. Yeah. <laughs> Maya had a point taken away at the very end of the fight because it was like five seconds left. LaFleur was coming at him, and Damian Maya was noticeably tired. And so in the last round, he pulled guard a couple times. And kind of like how Tyler's ladies did against Anderson Silva in their title fight in 97. You remember that fight? Yeah. Yeah, that fight. It basically looked like that in that last round um, for, like, the second half of it. And then he does it again in the at the end of the fight. And then John McCarthy, right as the bell rung, said, take a point away. What did he do? He, was just he literally back. fell back like he thought he was falling into a ball pit at Chuck E. Cheese. It was so funny. <laughs> he, he just floated backwards and went, woo. Like, he, like, rolled on, like, onto his back. As Flair threw a punch at him, it didn't connect, but it looked—it basically looked like he fell from the wind of the punch being thrown. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's not what happened, but that's just kind of how it looked. That's one way to defend. I guess, yeah, it was so funny though, just the way he fell back. If you can find the last fifteen seconds of the fight, it'll—it's—it's it's something to laugh at for sure. Yeah, I'll probably go back and watch it tonight. Yeah, but so with that, you know, Maya has a, has now beaten another guy that surprisingly a lot of people didn't have him beating. Maya was the underdog in this fight. Yeah, slid underdog, um, but he was. And so, yeah, was he ranked? Is he ranked? He was ranked seven. Really? LaFleur's yeah. what, 15? 14. 14? Uh, I wonder who he could fight next. They should just uh, make that. Make Maya Silva funny. next, too. I wouldn't even be a Maybe they give him Safadine. Who knows? Maybe. I wouldn't be opposed to him and Silva fighting. Those are two okay. very contrasting Brazilians fighting right there, and I would be yeah, I would be interested, be interested in that. seeing who'd win that. What? I'd be interested in that. Yeah. I mean those I mean they they're both Brazilian and I know so like Brazilians would probably be like, No, you can't put a Brazilian versus a Brazilian here, why not? Americans do that yeah. all the time out here. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, I mean and uh, yeah, if Silva was able to win that, that would be a huge win for him. Definitely. And uh yeah, just be ex I mean, like there's a lot of uh MMA guys versus MMA guys a lot, and more, more so with these newcomers coming up. It'd be fun to see a contrast in styles. Um, but those are the kind of matchups I like seeing because you never know who's going to win those. Especially yeah, with this. Yeah. Maya, you know, looking as good as he did, who, who's to say he can't take Silva down? And then with both guys being such good jiu-jitsu uh, artists, uh, what, like, how do you know he wouldn't be able to defend or would be able to defend? Maybe Maya gets a submission or even Eric Silva, maybe he gets yeah. a submission. But if Maya can keep... There's a lot if, of things that could happen. That yeah, fight. exactly. That's what I mean. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be opposed to seeing Silva and Maya fight next. Alright, buddy, so I gotta get out of here in a little bit, so what else? Well I mean, uh about? one thing that hasn't been announced on here specifically, even though we've announced it on the page and whatnot, Ronda Rousey's fighting Besh Kohea um at yep. UFC one ninety in the co in, in either the main event or the co main event in Brazil. Since it's in Brazil, I would assume it's the main event. I think they should make that a co main. Uh yeah, I've heard that. 
Um, I feel like it's I in Brazil like though, fight, so it's like not a huge. I feel like that fight's not going to be too competitive, and people are going to want to see a fight after that. <laughs> that's true, huh? I mean, that's kind of the gist you got after. That's kind of how you felt after the Cats and Donald fight, and uh, yeah, Ronda opened up as a fifteen to one favorite. <laughs> Dude, I'm not surprised. I mean, I mean, I'm like not, I'm not surprised. Up, that number is so rarely ever seen. Dude, she beat up Shayna Baszler and Jessamyn Duke, but. Well, yeah, obviously really Nunez much. can do that too. So it's <laughs> Nunez yeah, exactly. did it quicker this than her. Ronda's Rond on a much higher level. She just dismantled Katsangana. Yeah, it it will be. It's just more so because of the rivalry, the heat between them. Dude, did you hear Misha Tate saying that she's the only person that can beat Ronda? Uh yeah, I did. I, I mean, that, I thought that was hysterical. I wouldn't say hysterical. I mean, I'm, she's definitely the one who could give her the best fight. I wouldn't say yeah, she but beats her. That, but like, um, no, their second fight it went three rounds, but it wasn't competitive. Misha got beat up ninety nine percent of that fight. I would say like ninety five percent of that fight. Whatever it was, I mean, when five <laughs> percent, I'd say like something. a few seconds. Like, yeah, were, she landed a few punches, but the striking wasn't really. Yeah, Misha wasn't dominating and on the feet or anything. Speaking of which, uh, another fight that's being targeted for June, and it's been t- said by the UFC that it's the number one contenders fight for Ronda uh, or Betch. <laughs> Tate versus, um, Tate versus I. I uh, this is the next number one contenders matchup. I hope Jessica I wins that fight, honestly. Yeah, just to yeah. give Ronda a new name. But, New uh, name. I really see Tate winning really that though. Really good on the feet, where I think she can take if she's able to. Like, I don't think she'll be able to stop Ronda from getting her to the mat, but she can give her trouble on the feet. Oh, definitely. I would love to see just guy get the win, get in there, and then fight her again. Tate's a very um, fun fighter to watch in that division. She really is in like yeah, Sangano territory exciting, right now because of the fights, fact. But, I feel like she's in some, like Junior Dos Santos territory where she's the number two chick. She, I yeah. really feel like that's her. I mean, I, I wouldn't be opposed to I seeing agree. Tate fighting Cat again in a rematch. Um, I just, would like to see Tate and Cat. That would be cool. Yeah. I thought Misha was winning that fight until it got stopped. And I yeah, that was yeah. another comeback for Cat. It wasn't even the best stoppage. It was an okay stoppage, I guess. But I think Misha could have won that fight. Maybe. I mean, Cat broke her nose in that last flurry. Yeah, no, I know. But I mean, I would like to see it again, see how it went. For sure. I agree. I mean, the women's division is uh is is interesting, but at the same time, very, very hollow in the sense that you feel like anybody that does get to the top, um, is just gonna fall right back down. Yeah, it's just because Ronda's so dominant that it's it doesn't really matter. Like you, yeah, every. That's why I, I love strawweight, man. Strawweight's this division now where we yeah, introduced we it, and there's already been two champions. So Carla was going to stay on top for a while. That did not happen. Yeah, I mean, that's why I like – I was saying this on the last podcast with, with Jonas, I believe. I don't know if you were on with us. But um, I was trying to – us like speaking to – you know, I, I would like to see a division that's competitive in that, you know, the title changes hands a few times if that or, you know, at least the, the title the title holder gets challenged in good yeah, fights. Yeah, they got to get tested. Like there, there's a difference when you see a guy like uh, – I don't know, the – like when you see Ronda and DJ that are just dominating their division, and then and, we have and, like but they're new divisions. Fights. That's the thing. When you have like, I don't know. Even if the title isn't changing hands, if there's a dominant champion like Chris Weidman, he has Machida test him, and you have guys that are just like that division is full of killers, and there's a new guy knocking at the doorstep every time around. That's fun. Yeah, but I mean, when you have like Weidman has a lot of tests that you're like, hmm, I don't know if you can beat this guy. That's gonna be a fun yeah. fight. Like Rockhold, Jacare, um, Rockhold, Jacare, Joel, Joel Romero. Yeah, there's yeah. so many guys. But then it's like with Ronda. Yeah, she had a lot of girls at first, but now she's just running through them. Like if Wy- if Weidman would just start, if Weidman was just destroying everyone and it he's de- took out all the contenders, it might start to get a little bit boring. But yeah, right but now, see, that's fun. the thing about strawweight, and, uh, and I'm excited. But what's funny is that it's, the division is so brand new that right now there's not anybody next to face Jedrzejczyk. And I think, I honestly oh, yeah. think the winner will be because Juliana Lima has a win under her belt, and so does Pena, and or Pena, not Pena, uh, Pene, Jessica Pene. Um, yeah. Those two are fighting in June at UFC Fight Night 67. Um, I see. I think the winner of that probably fights her. Panay's ranked number three. Lima's ranked number eight. Um, Dude, regardless, I don't know. I think uh, Jessica Panay, if she's 
forced to stand up and can't get it to the ground by pulling guard or something, she's going to get beat up too. Yeah, well, I think, honestly, Panay is a better striker than Carla. Oh, yeah, I mean. I'm not saying she's on J- 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 or uh, young J- Jake Chick's level. Is, but What are you saying? Yeah, I guess her the way to say her last name is Young Jake Chick. Young Jake Chick. Okay. Young Jake Chick. I'll I spell mean, it out for you in, in English because there's no yeah, way. Yeah, no, I, I know. Um, basically, I think Carla is one of the not well, – not, I wouldn't say the worst striker in the division, but she's down there. No, yeah, it's her grappling that's always been the prime thing. She gets you yeah, down. You're, like, you're in some shit. Tisha Torres, she just don't on takedowns desperately. Yeah, well, Tisha Torres actually likes to utilize her hands to set up takedowns, which is actually yeah. better than how Carla does it. She doesn't set them up with her takedowns she up with striking shoots. too much. She just shoots, yeah. And, yeah. um, I don't know. I think I don't. I think eventually, soon enough, if uh, Joanna is able to hold on the title for a little bit, we'll see a rematch between her and uh, Claudia Gadella, who I thought won their first fight. Yeah, that was a close fight. She dropped her though. She had the most. She probably did yeah, more no, damage I thought to she Claudia. Won the third round, but I thought the first two rounds were Gadella's. Well, no, I mean she hit. I, I felt like she she did better in the first round than Claudia. It was it was uh, she obviously won the second round. Know, yeah, see, it was close. so close that like, you can't call it a robbery, but. It was a yeah, close no, fight. Yeah, I didn't think it was a robbery. I just thought it was really close. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, that division being new with a lot of competitors, a lot of big names, especially like Paige Van Zandt, Felice Herrick. Um, yeah, I mean. All kind, you know, yeah. and, and who who knows? I don't I don't think that they should, but the winner of that fight could also probably get uh, Joe Jacek next anyway. Yeah, I don't, th- even though as good as it would be for, uh, I don't I guess, it would be easier to use one of those two girls in a title fight. I don't think either one of them would do too well in that fight now. I think they'd be too ready for it. I think Felice would do all right. Paige Van Zandt. Felice might do better than Paige, but. Yeah, I, I think, I well, I think I Felice is a more complete fighter. Fight. I, I think Felice might be Paige. That's a pretty good fight, but mm-hmm. I. I think if Paige wins that fight and they try to put her in a title fight already. Yeah, I no, I don't. Yeah, see, fight. that's what I'm thinking, too. And, I, and it's more yeah, so because. And tough. that card looks great, yeah, too. Like I was saying before. The skill level of a lot of girls, you don't even really want to put them in there with the champion because, I mean, there's not really – the skill level in comparison to the other division isn't as high yet. Yeah. I am i can't wait. Uh, that April card looks so good, the April 11th card at UFC on yeah, Fox. Yeah, the but, jersey card, right? Oh, yeah. Dude, I got – I applied for credentials for that card through um, MMA Nuts, and I got denied, and I was so upset. <laughs> you got the what? I didn't get I didn't get the credentials accepted. So oh I was upset. man, that's a bummer. I was yeah. so happy I got to go to eighty one eighty four. That was a great event. Yeah, I would have just liked to go and work it. I mean, I could if there's still tickets, I might wind up going. But who knows? Who does know? There's a lot of. Uh, oh, what do you think about Shogun fighting Little Nog on that card? One ninety. Yeah, it's a cool fight. I mean, it's a good fight they made. I mean, it's a good fight. Makes I sense in the sense that's, that's kind of where they're both at right now. What? It's kind of where they're both at right now, anyway. But yeah, it's really exactly. odd it's to me like, that it's not Nogueira, like I'm too excited about it. Maybe if it was they fought before, right? Yeah, once it was like one of the best pride fights they ever had back yeah. like nearly ten years ago, I think. Now. Yeah, um, I mean it's cool. It's a nostalgia fight. It could sell just because they're both names. But I'm not like insanely excited about it or anything. Yeah, the thing about it is like <laughs> that bothers me is that they're both ranked and they should not. Oh yeah. Them. Yeah, Noguera. <laughs> Noguera, um, what is, oh, he, I guess he beat Rashad, so I guess that's why he's there and it hasn't been a year since he has fought yet, so he's still ranked. Yeah. And then Shogun lost recently to Henderson? No, he lost to somebody else. Oh, OSP. Yeah. Yeah. Has lost two straight now. Yeah, he's got issues. Alright, so it's weird. It's I don't know. It's uh, but we'll see what what happens. But uh, I figure you gotta get out of here because you're yeah. pressing time. But also I'll bring this up on the Wednesday Wednesday podcast. We got more stuff to talk about. But we'll get yeah, I'll make sure to get on Wednesday. I'll be back again. Um, yeah. thank you all for listening. We really appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoyed the Johnny Case interview. And um, you can follow me on Twitter at Chris Paluka or at Sports of Anarchy. I'm in control of that. And uh, you need to, you know you need to spell that right. My last name, my name? Yeah. C H R I S P A G L I U C A. And uh, also like the Sports of Anarchy page on Facebook <laughs> and like the MMA discussion page on Facebook too. 
Get at it. Yeah, it's exciting. Hey, man, when and when Fight Night comes around, Fight Fans, get at us on the page. There's a lot of good discussions to be had uh, during the yeah. fights. Um, we appreciate Chris for coming on. And uh, our, Chris, ha, Johnny, we appreciate Johnny for coming on today. Hollywood case. Uh, can't wait to see him fight again. Uh, exciting per, uh, fighter. Cool personality. He was real. He was just for real. Yeah, no, um, he's a cool dude. He's really chill. Didn't care what he said. I mean, not like he was saying anything wrong, but he was just easygoing. Had a really cool personality. Seemed like a really good guy. Yeah, one of the things Errol Hawani says about fighters and why he loves his job is because instead of other than basketball players other than um football players other than you know any other sports uh athletes mma fighters probably are the most real guys you can interview and talk to and i really feel that way i feel like we're just talking to just you know your average joe and um but you know that the guy works his ass off he works hard and you know he sounds like a humble dude he doesn't sound cocky he doesn't sound like you know he's got like he he really has a chip on his shoulder at all and uh That makes I mean, me – I'm a I big fan it, now. I think there are guys like that in MMA, especially when you get higher up the ranks where they're making more money. And but Maybe. A lot of times you don't really find that. A lot of these guys are really cool. I've had the pleasure of meeting tons of fighters in person. I mean, even Same. just as a fan, before I was really doing any fighting or knowing any fighters just about three years ago, I went to my first event in Jersey. And, I mean, I was just going up to guys saying, what's up, and – having conversations with guys like Luke Barnett was one of the coolest guys I met in person. I talked to Mike Easton and guys like that really down to earth guys. And they always have been. So, I mean, that's why I love being involved in this sport. Yeah. Johnny case. I'm a fan. I uh, can't wait to see you in there again. Uh, fight fans. You want to hit them up? You heard the info. Just rewind it back. <laughs> um, for me, you want to hit me up uh, at Nick the Phantom on Twitter. Again, hit the hit up the MMA discussion Facebook page if you want to do me a favor. Go ahead and share that page. <laughs> um, you know, obviously it's the second page we've had. We used to have a much larger following, um, and then our page got hacked and deleted. And now we still got yeah, the small so, page, so but it's actually nice. It's nice having a, a lot of diehards that are, that are there still and talking and getting with us, and we appreciate that. Yeah, but so help it grow back up, and uh, we'll get it there a couple of years. Page, you know. Can, Listen to podcast on Stitcher and iTunes, and if you give us a rating and review on either one of those, if you enjoyed it, it really helps a lot, guys. Yeah, we we'll really you, appreciate everything. We'll give you candy. Yeah. <laughs> Not for, for the last thing Not is uh, candy, just regular candy. <laughs> for me, it's uh, it's more so also um, oh, I was gonna say something. Oh, what I forgot it. Budge. Maybe I'll remember for the next podcast. Until then, uh, Fight Fans, we'll go ahead and sign off. Um, we so appreciate you. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was just going to say something about Stitcher. For, for some fans that have been hitting me up on uh, on Twitter, um, I know you guys have said uh, you'd like to subscribe to the iTunes podcast. You don't have enough room on your phone. Get the Stitcher app. The Stitcher app um, uh, actually doesn't take up any data from your phone. It's just this. Uh, it's just basically having access to the Internet, essentially. Um, yeah, you can do it on there. If you want uh, on iTunes, you can always do it from your computer, whatever. Yeah, but for those on the go who want to move out, like, you know, listen to the podcast yeah, on your listen phone. Listen in your car, you can listen anywhere, working out, on the go, whatever. Yeah, for, and so that's why I'm just saying for Stitcher, it doesn't take up any data on your phone. And can, like, if you don't have any gigs left uh, to, to really get, uh, get our podcast on your phone, Stitcher is the way to go. Plus, there's all kinds of cool podcasts and music bands that put their music and, and shows up on there. So uh, I think you'd have a fun time on there. Five fans, go to Stitcher. Right. Get it done. All right, we're out of here. We appreciate right. you, five fans. Episode 28, signing off. Thank you again, Johnny Case. Chris, we'll talk to you. We'll get this next one up on Thursday. Very soon, yeah. When we'll get this up soon. I'll have the written interview with Johnny Case up on MMANuts.com within the next few days, and then we'll have another podcast for you guys sometime later this week. Get it. Later.